This is East Asia Tonight. Good evening, I'm Otelia Edwards. Tonight's top stories. Chinese GDP growth slows further, but the latest figures also point to a possible bottoming out and hope that recent stimulus measures will dig the economy out of a hole. Appearing into the crystal ball at the future China Global Forum here in Singapore, what experts have to say about China's economic outlook. A tightrope act for Britain's top diplomat on a visit to China, aiming to rebuild frayed ties while challenging Beijing on human rights and the war in Ukraine. South Korea deplores an alleged North Korean troop dispatch to Russia, calling it a grave security threat to the international community. And Singapore authorities thwart a terror plot by a 17-year-old student. The radicalised youth was planning a knife attack in a busy residential neighbourhood. Ahead on East Asia tonight, campaigning in full swing ahead of Japan's snap polls next week. We take a look at the process and at why the ruling LDP may be finding it harder to secure votes. China's economic data out today revealing some tentative signs of improvement but underlining deep-seated issues that remain. Uh, as a matter of fact, Roland Lim is here with all the details. Roland? Thanks, Natalie. China's economic growth losing steam in the third quarter with GDP coming in at its slowest pace since early 2023 when the country was emerging from its strict zero-COVID policy. Third quarter GDP grew 4.6% on yes, slightly higher than expectations, but lower than the 4.7% expansion the previous quarter. And that's as a persistent debt crisis in the property sector and sluggish consumer demand pose major challenges in Beijing's efforts to, reinv it reinv it to reinvigorate the country's economic growth. But other key indicators released show some improvements in parts of the economy. Industrial production and retail sales for last month both beat market expectations. Fixed asset investment for the year to September also came in slightly higher than anticipated, although funding to the property sector did plunge to 10.1%. CNA's Olivia Xiong has been speaking to experts all day at the Future China Global Forum, taking place at the Sands Expo and Convention Centre in Singapore. Olivia, take it away. Roland, you know, there was pleasant surprise from economists we've been speaking to here that the Q3 GDP growth figure did come in better than forecast. But the consensus also is that there is still a long road ahead for China to make a full economic recovery and to boost its economy uh, from this slowing growth and to address its economic headwinds. The Q3 data today, as you mentioned there, 4.6% growth year on year misses China's economic growth target of around 5% for a second straight quarter, uh, underscoring the need for strong stimulus. And analysts say that partly the reason why we have seen this policy shift and at the end of last month, a flurry of stimulus measures wide ranging from numerous government agencies being announced, including key rate cuts, lowering borrowing costs, moves to stop the property market from falling further. Also trying to address perhaps one of the key underlying challenges in China's economy, that of weak domestic consumption. Now, I asked um, one economist how sustainable, given this somewhat uh, you know, uptick that we've seen in the stock market or in property purchases, some bright spots, but how sustainable is this momentum in the long run? Here's what he had to say. Well, when we talk about consumption, consumption is a function of three things. Number one is your income growth. Number two is your income expectation. Number three is your wealth effect. So before the recent rally of the equity market, there was no wealth effect in China, not from property, not from the equities. That's why I think with the more support to the equity market, I think this rally of the equity market become increasingly more and more important. If we can create the wealth effect from the equity market, that may translate to the stronger consumption in the future. So which means how long the rally of the equity market will be also important to decide how sustainable is the recovery of this domestic demand. Olivia, what does today's economic data tell us about what's ahead for China and its challenges? 
Well, the expectation is that there are more policy moves to come. That is the signal that we are getting from Chinese authorities. And what economists have said about the current policy announcements that we have seen so far is that the signal is clear that there is going to be more stimulus. But what is lacking is the details. And one thing that we are looking out for uh, this month is a scheduled meeting by China's top legislature's standing committee where changes uh, to the central government's budget could be announced and any other further fiscal stimulus uh, measures if any, could be approved. Now, during the 2008 financial crisis, a 4 trillion yuan stimulus package was launched by China, which works out to about 10% of the country's uh, GDP. And I did ask economists uh, what figure we could be looking at this time round, but uh, a former advisor to China's central bank, David Dao Kui Li, what he told me is that this figure is not so important. One of the bigger policy measures that needs to happen, in his opinion, is to also address another concern of high local government debt. Here's what he had to say. The local governments normally spend around 41% of GDP whatever, either hiring employees or be, uh, doing construction, 41%. By the way, consumers only spend about 38% of GDP. The number might be too, you know, too, too inaccurate, too, too much, it's un, downward biased. Anyway, so local governments are now shrinking because they are pushed to pay back their debt. They have accumulated around, by my calculation, 100% GDP in the amount of local debt. They simply cannot service the debt, let, let alone paying back the debt. So local governments in turn are squeezing their, some of their employees, delaying their welfare or bonus payments, while squeezing their suppliers, delaying payments. So by my calculation, around 7 to 8 percent, may even be 10 percent of GDP is in the amount, is the amount of the delayed payment. So once debt swap is done, this 10% of GDP will be gradually released to various suppliers. That is the single most important physical stimulus. By the way, this is not a physical deficit. This is an asset liability operation of the government. But beyond the final figure for fiscal stimulus that may be announced, what analysts are saying is that the implementation of these policy measures is far more important. During a panel that I moderated here at the forum, one economist stressed that the challenge will be balancing uh, the short and long-term goals of China. He acknowledged that while some of these stimulus measures that we are seeing right now are coming a little bit late, there are only three more months uh, for till the end of the year for China to meet its economic growth target of around 5% growth. Um, but he said that something close to 5% growth is still within reach with all these new measures that has been announced. But he also did say that China is unlikely to give up on some of the long-term structural changes that it's trying to make for its economy, even if it may cause them some pain in the meantime. Have a listen. I don't think the Chinese government is going to give up its long-term structural adjustment goals. Okay? Uh, for the housing sector, I think uh, uh, the adjustments uh, has reached uh, its end. Okay? Uh, so after three years uh, of deleveraging in the sector, so we see the sales uh, in the housing sector has been uh, declined by how much? 60 percent, right? This year probably a little bit more. There is a kind of an overshooting uh, in the sector. And look at the uh, last uh, round, uh, this round of the central uh, bank's policy, and particularly today's uh, announcement. Uh, you see that the housing sector is uh, come back to, to normality, okay? On the demand side, only three cities still have restrictions on purchase. On the supply side, I think basically the central bank policy just lifts all the restrictions on lending. I think that's good, right? That means the whole sector has come back to normality. 
probably we are not, we are not going to see uh, housing prices uh, to go up uh, uh, really quickly, but uh, I now feel more confident that this sector is going to stabilize. Olivia, we appreciate those updates. That was Olivia Xiong reporting live from the Future China Global Forum in Singapore. We'll be back with her a little later on at the event to discuss China's ambitions to lead in artificial intelligence. Singapore's Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet was among the speakers at the Future China Global Forum. He says in order for China and other economies to grow, they must make structural adjustments to build new sources of competitive advantage. He adds that China would embark on difficult changes and regain its path to growth. The resourcefulness of the public sector and the entrepreneurship of the private sector was key to how China escaped the poverty trap in the 1980s. The next phase of development, resourcefulness and entrepreneurship will be even more important as China is no longer in a catch-up phase of growth but has to be at the frontier, pushing in a very different direction. Science, technology and innovation, particularly AI, would, will shape future economies. And that's why educational systems need to be reformed and workers need to be reskilled so that no one gets left behind. At the same time, it was also critical for economies to pursue regional economic integration and deepen cooperation, such as through ASEAN. He noted that the talks to upgrade the ASEAN-China free trade area was near completion. For each economy to thrive, it needs to build distinctive competitive niches while cooperating with other economies to solve common challenges like climate change. In the coming years, science, technology and innovation will critically shape our future and our future society, our future economy. And I'll do it for business, Otelli. Back well, to you. I hope you would be reinvigorated after this weekend, ready to tackle the Singapore International oh. Energy Week starting on Monday. Right, on that note, we're going to go for a short break now, but coming up next on East Asia Tonight. The community sees the importance of the South China Sea as, a, uh, as an area or region which is essential for international trade investment as well as commercial trafficking and shipping. CNA Saksitsa Sambat speaks with the Philippine Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Enrique Manalo, who says all countries have a stake in ensuring sovereign disputes remain peaceful. And the US and China boosting anti-smuggling measures as Washington deports a second flight of Chinese migrants. British Foreign Secretary David Lamy will be meeting his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi in Beijing today as he visits China seeking to overhaul bilateral ties. Well, Mr Lamy's trip is a first by a senior UK official since the new Labour government took office in July. Before departing London, Britain's top diplomat says that engagement with China is pragmatic and necessary to support the UK and global interests, adding that both sides should speak often and in a candid manner. Downing Street has acknowledged significant differences with Beijing and says that uh, Mr. Lamy is committed to challenging China where he must. And uh, for more analysis, we have Oli Barrett joining us live from London. Uh, so, Oli, in a nutshell, what are some of the more contentious issues that Mr. Lamy will be confronting China with and what exactly is the UK prioritising when it comes to bolstering uh, bilateral ties? Well, I tell you, I think the UK is prioritising trying to be, you used the word, pragmatic in its relationship with China. Indeed, in the two press releases we've had from the UK Foreign Office um, about the trip so far, and they are quite short press releases, um, I have counted uh, around nine mentions of that word, pragmatic. It illustrates that they are trying to tread a difficult line between prioritising boosting trade ties with China so that economic growth can be boosted here in the UK, but also uh, other issues are that in which they feel they can cooperate, such as climate change, for example, and progress towards net zero. And then those uh, listed challenges that David Lammy has set out and that some other UK parliamentarians have urged him to address while he is 
in Beijing. I mean, David Lammy himself talks about uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He talks about uh, other foreign policy challenges around Taiwan as well. He talks about human rights and democracy, uh, and he talks about Hong Kong. So there are clearly several areas of the London-Beijing relationship which have the potential to be very difficult indeed. The UK government insisting, as you say, that there will be challenges put where they are necessary, but also trying to balance all of that with the need and the desire from London's perspective of making sure that economic ties remain strong and therefore that economic growth back home can be boosted. And that's why the second day of trip will see David Lammy heading to Shanghai to meet with British businesses there. And Oli, I mean, let's talk about the timing and why now, you know, after years of strained relations that the UK is trying to mend relations uh, now. The why now is partly because we just have a new government and the Labour government that's come to power believes that the Conservative Party before it had a muddled, inconsistent approach when it comes to China. Now, the Conservatives would dispute that, but it is certainly the case that there were many different forms of attempts to change the relationship between the UK and China, going back to David Cameron's much vaunted golden age of relations in 2010, which then uh, very much changed by the time that, for example, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak were in 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister. So the Labour Party insists it wants to bring some consistency to this relationship. It promised that there would be a so-called audit of ties between the UK and China. That audit is underway. We don't know exactly when it will conclude or exactly what it will conclude. But the other part of the answer to your question about why now comes back to that issue of economic growth. We have a budget approaching here in the UK at the end of the month, the first for this new government. The new government insists that economic growth is one of its major priorities and it sees China as crucial to that. Well, thanks very much for that report. Ollie Barrett speaking to us live from London. The confrontations between China and the Philippines have increased in the South China Sea with both sides routinely accusing the other of encroaching territorial lines. And our correspondent, Saksit Sasombat, stepped down from an interview with the Philippines foreign minister, who says that the region is a flashpoint of tensions that requires as much international attention as a war in Ukraine. Is it fair to say, from your perspective, that Western partners are being spread thin by everything that's going on around the world? Or do you also, by that point, expect this region and your countries in the neighborhood to be forced to become more self-reliant? I think it's been quite clear that what's happening, for example, in Europe uh, and what's happening here, the, some of the tensions here in Asia, are related in many ways. Uh, and so I don't see any diminution of interest. Because, for example, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, for example, in the South China Sea, we're exactly in the same situation as in Ukraine. But I'm saying everyone sees, the international community sees the importance of the South China Sea as, a, uh, as an area or region which is essential for international trade investment as well as commercial trafficking and shipping. So everyone has a stake in ensuring that the South China Sea remains stable and peaceful. And this is all countries, whether they're from uh, Europe, Middle East, Asia, West, they see the importance of this region. And I think that's uh, just based on that indicates that, uh, that I don't think that their sites will be uh, driven away from South China Sea because of what's happening elsewhere, given the importance of our region. And as uh, you well know, in many countries, uh, even in Asia, were affected by the conflict in the Ukraine, and there still are. So there are unfortunate links between these these uh, areas, but I think those also help promote. Uh, a greater awareness of the need for cooperation among different regions. And for more on what the Philippines plans to do to ensure a rules-based order in the South China Sea, tune in to Asia tonight for the rest of the interview. The U.S. and China are beefing up anti-smuggling measures. Washington says it sent a second flight of migrants back to China for repatriation. Now, this is the second time this year the Department of Homeland Security sent Chinese citizens away. 
Well, back in July, more than 100 were repatriated, the first such flight since 2018. Border officials say more than 21,000 Chinese citizens were apprehended in the border with Mexico from January to August alone. And uh, back in 2022, China refused to accept returning citizens on chartered flights from the U.S. It has resumed cooperation this year with a promise to strengthen enforcement to combat smuggling and other serious crimes. The U.S. Homeland Security Chief Alejandro Mayorkas also warns would-be illegal migrants not to believe the lies of smugglers and that uh, they would be subject to swift removal. Post-pandemic, Chinese nationals were the third largest source of immigrants in 2022 behind Mexico and India. The United States has imposed sanctions against two Chinese companies that it says is linked to the production of drones Russia uses in its Ukraine offensive. This was the first time we actually saw a Chinese company manufacturing a weapon itself that then was used on the battlefield by Russia, was sent to Russia and then used on the battlefield. And that's why we imposed the sanctions that we did today. And that is why we continue to um, work with our allies and partners around the world to make clear to China that this practice is unacceptable and they need to take steps to counter it. A Russian company as well as Russian national were also sanctioned. Washington says the drone is designed and developed by China-based experts and produced at Chinese factories together with a Russian defense firms before being transferred to Russia for use against Ukraine. The move comes as the U.S. warns of closer ties between China and Russia. In the meantime, China has hit back at the sanctions, criticizing it as illegal and unjustifiable. It argues that the country handles the export of military products responsibly and strictly controls the export of dual-use articles, which include drones for civilian use. South Korea is alleging that North Korea has been sending troops to Russia to aid its war against Ukraine. Seoul says this represents a grave threat to the world and vows to respond with all means available. This follows an unscheduled meeting between South Korean President Yoon suk yeol and top security officials to discuss the development. A Yonhap news agency quoting Seoul's spy agency says 12,000 North Korean troops, including a special forces unit, were dispatched to Russia. The South Korean presidential office earlier said that the move is being closely monitored with uh, allies, but uh, it did not provide any evidence to back the deployment claim. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, on Thursday also made a similar assertion, citing Kyiv's own intel. But NATO's chief, Mark Root, said that there was no proof of Pyongyang's presence at the moment. These latest claims add to repeated accusations by Seoul and Washington that North Korea has been supplying weaponry to Russia. Both Moscow and Pyongyang have denied that any arms transfers took place. A North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, has called the blowing up of road and rail links to the south as marking the end of what he called an evil relationship. Speaking for the first time about Tuesday's detonation, Mr. Kim said the evil relations with the south lasted century after century, adding that the blocking of roads completely removes the unreasonable idea of reunification. State media reports that Mr. Kim made those comments during a visit to an army unit headquarters. The North Korean leader referred to South Korea as a hostile country, a term that KCNA reported yesterday that uh, is now also being used to define the South in North Korea's constitution. Mr. Kim also discussed the changing relationship between Seoul and Washington and called for a strong North Korean nuclear deterrent. Well, another break is up next, but uh, coming up in East Asia tonight, a potential turning point in a war in Gaza after Israel kills Hamas chief Yahya Sinwar. You're watching East Asia tonight right here in CNA. A tightrope act for Britain's top diplomat on a visit to China, aiming to rebuild frayed ties while challenging Beijing on human rights and the war in Ukraine. Chinese GDP growth slows further, but the latest figures also point to a possible bottoming out and hope that recent stimulus measures will dig the economy out of a hole. And peering into the crystal ball at the future China Global Forum here in Singapore, what uh, experts have to say about China's economic outlook. 
And CNA's Olivia Xiong has been covering the future China Global Forum. And uh, she joins us once again live from the Sands Expo and Convention Center in Singapore. Uh, so, Olivia, China's economy getting a lot of tension in recent weeks and months. Uh, but beyond the stimulus, what are industry players uh, saying about the long-term trajectory and uh, China's economic transformation? I'll tell you, you said it there. There's been a lot of focus on the stimulus measures that China has announced in the last few weeks because they're so wide-ranging and the uh, force of it has been something to talk about. But what has been less talked about is the long-term trajectory of China's economic growth, not forgetting that their ultimate goal, they say, is to transform its economy from one that's focused on high-speed growth to high-quality growth and introducing new drivers of growth including artificial intelligence. Now, China has set a goal of being an AI leader by 2030. But just how much progress has it made? I spoke to an industry leader, and this is what he told me. Well, China has made a, a, a I mean, tremendous effort to advance its AI technology, AI applications. It has achieved a lot. But in this wave of AI, and especially uh, when it comes to uh, large models, large language models or, or multi-modality models, it's, it's very clear there is one leader, which is uh, you know, uh, uh, represented by OpenAI and uh, 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 Google and uh, Anthropic. This is the U.S. Uh, definitely is in the leading position. Uh, in terms of uh, 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 fundamental breakthroughs, in terms of uh, where the direction should be and uh, where the efforts should, put it, should be put in, uh, I would say China is still a follower. And that you know, uh, does not mean that China is not leading in many areas in AI. Actually, when it comes to application, I think China has a, a tremendous advantage. Especially if you look at what happened the last 15 years in mobile internet, and you look at the, the progress that in various companies like ByteDance, like Baidu, like Alibaba has, have made in the uh, uh, AI application area, uh, China has a very good foundation. Frontier research in AI, there is a long way to go, a long way to go. And the good news is the government realized the problem. The government uh, has been putting a lot of funding into it. Uh, but this is a long-term effort. Oh, I, you know, it has to uh, has a lot to do with the, the education system, a lot to do with the, with the uh, composition of the talent, and uh, has a lot to do with uh, how do we encourage private sectors to invest more. Uh, honestly, I feel that uh, it is the private sector is uh, uh, internet companies, uh, they should be the leader in uh, uh, pushing uh, the frontiers and uh, in not only uh, in application, but also in uh, um, uh, fundamental uh, uh, research. Uh, the fact is, if you look at the best uh, AI models came out of, uh, from various organizations, uh, definitely they, it's a one that come from the uh, private sectors, you know, the, uh, either it's the uh, Kimi from uh, you know the startup uh, out of uh, uh, Tsinghua University and the uh, Beijing Academy of AI, or it's it's the uh, I mean Kai Fu Li's uh, new company, or uh, a big a big uh, uh, internet platform companies like uh, uh, Alibaba and ByteDance. They are the front runners, and they have put in a lot of funding, and uh, they have recruited the best people. Yeah. But how much of uh, China's efforts or its progress is being hampered by the ongoing tech race with the U.S.? Well, if there is anything, the competition actually will make people working harder and uh, you know have a sense of uh, uh, urgency. Uh, I think the, if there is one thing you know, uh, China uh, has to improve, that is how in, this, in the current ge geopolitical situation, how to continue to cooperate with uh, in, uh, you know, international community, with uh, researchers. 
outside of China, and China should you know continue to be open, and the uh, and to encourage its researchers to to uh, go go out, to encourage its students to go out, to uh, uh, you know work in the West countries. Of course, this is uh, this is uh, a, a not a technical issue. It's more a geopolitical issue. But uh, you know, China has a lot to do. Yeah. One of the key areas that you have been working on is uh, artificial intelligence, safety, and governance. Right. Is this an area that you see potential further collaboration between big powers like China or even other countries as well? AI safety is not a a a, a, a issue for uh, of us, uh, any single country. It's an issue we uh, human race face, and. You know, I, I have been working in this field uh, for in the last 18 months. I'm glad to see more and more scientists, uh, and policymakers, uh, realize this issue, realize this potential risk. This is not a risk we used to talk about, like uh, disinformation, like uh, deep fake. Mm -hmm. This is existential risk for human race. Now, there's also recognition that as China undergoes this economic transformation and um, introduces new sectors and drivers of growth, that there will be some pain uh, that it has to go through. And we know that unemployment and jobs continue to be a persistent issue that the government has tried to tackle. And so there'll certainly be a lot to look out for in the months and years ahead as China tries to address its short and long-term structural issues. Atelier. I know it's been a long day for you, Olivia. I'm going to let you go. Thanks so very much. Olivia Siong at the Future China Global Forum in Singapore. Now, Singapore authorities have foiled plans by a 17-year-old student to mount a terror attack in a busy residential neighborhood. Well, he was arrested in August, just weeks before executing a plan to kill non-Muslim males. The radicalized youth was placed under a two-year detention a detention order in September, and he was a staunch Islamic State supporter. Now, this is where the teen planned to carry out a knife attack, a high-traffic open space in Tampines within walking distance of his home. In June, he toured the route he would take for the attack, and he was first exposed to the teachings of foreign radical preachers in August 2023 while searching for religious knowledge online. By January this year, he aspired to die as a martyr while fighting for Islamic State, pledging his allegiance to the terrorist group in May. He was planning, prepared to travel to Syria to fight with ISIS. But then he faced difficulties in getting there. So he then changed. He decided to do the attack in Singapore. He basically wanted to obey ISIS's call to kill non-Muslims, wherever they are. And uh, this boy, he had made extensive plans, preparations, and he was determined to carry out his attack in Singapore. The youth also shared radical materials promoting armed jihad online, including chants by IS. Investigations show that he was a lone wolf and did not succeed in radicalizing those around him. His family and friends were also unaware of his plans, though they had advised him against watching videos of foreign preachers. In this case, the young boy's parents noticed that he was watching videos by foreign preachers. They advised him not to watch those videos. And when he did not listen, an option would have been to alert the authorities. So it really would be good if family members and friends reported to the authorities quickly if they suspect that someone they know is being radicalized. Israel says the war in Gaza is not over, even after it said the mastermind of Hamas's 7th of October attack, Yahya Sinwa, has been killed. Sinwa's body was apparently identified through DNA tests and has been brought to Tel Aviv for further examination. Hamas has not confirmed his death, but Iran's UN mission seems to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge it, saying that the spirit of resistance will be strengthened by the killing. Hezbollah has vowed to escalate its war against Israel in response. Sinwa was Hamas's top leader in Gaza. For weeks, there was speculation on the whereabouts of the 61-year-old. 
He had gone silent while Israel carried out a wave of assassinations of militant leaders. Israel says he was cornered in the southern city of Rafah. This is said to be his final moments captured by a drone camera. The IDF says Sinwa was found hiding in a room, wearing a mask and his hand wounded. He threw a stick at the drone. The IDF fired a shell that collapsed the building, killing Sinwa. Israel's leader warned the rest of Hamas to surrender. While this is not the end of the war in Gaza, it's the beginning of the end. To the people of Gaza, I have a simple message. This war can end tomorrow. It can end if Hamas lays down its arms and returns our hostages. But to those who would harm our hostages, I have another message. Israel will hunt you down and bring you to justice. Israelis celebrated after hearing the news of Sinwa's killing, but families of hostages are far from jubilant, saying their loved ones are in great danger now more than ever. They urge Israel and the U.S. to get a deal done quickly. They might murder them or do something because of the murder of uh, Sinwa, and that's the thing that I'm, I'm afraid of. Gazans devastated by more than a year of Israeli attacks say the killing of Sinwa will not end the war. هذه مقاومة لا تزول بزوال الرجال واغتيال الصنوار لن يفضي إلى توقف المقاومة أو إلى تنازل أو استسلام المقاومة ورفع الراية البيضاء اغتيل قبل ذلك The U.S. called Sinwa the chief obstacle to ceasefire talks. Question is, will his absence make reaching a deal any easier? Well, analysts are weighing in on whether the death of Yaya Sinwa could mark a turning point in a war in Gaza. The equivalent of the U.S. killing of Osama bin Laden. Sinwar having been the mastermind of 10-7, this closes the chapter on him. It's very unlikely that Sinwar's assassination in and of itself will see an end to hostilities. He is the man, Yahya Sinwar, almost single-handedly, who planned, orchestrated the 7th of October attack on Israel. He planned for Iran and for all of Iran's long arms, meaning the proxies, Hezbollah, and the militias that Iran funds and trains in Syria and in Iraq to join the fight and try to eliminate the state of Israel off the map. The reality is without Sinwar in place, I think Hamas is probably more interested in a hostage deal. He was the person that was really keeping things together. Even as much of the group has said, they really are exhausted, they need time to stop, they would rather have some sort of deal. Um, that opportunity may now begin. And so Sinwar having been the mastermind of 10-7, this closes the chapter on him. But as you heard from Netanyahu, it may not quite close the chapter on military operations in Gaza. Well, Iyawa uh, Sinwar was part of an organization that more or less sees uh, its leadership decimated and killed. It was almost part of its career ladder. Uh, the idea that Hamas leadership is, is assassinated by Israel is, is part of what they do. Uh, it's what they experience. And they have built-in mechanisms, including in their Politburo, their governing body, to replace these leaders quickly. So Sinwar's death in and of itself doesn't cripple the organization. It doesn't change its immediate capabilities. It does create a succession question, and the succession question will give us some answers as to what the organization as a whole would like to do in the future. Coming up next on East Asia Tonight. Election campaigning in full swing in Japan ahead of next week's snap polls. The ruling party is fielding more than 300 candidates, but nine members tainted by a slush fund scandal are not among them. Plus, counting down to the U.S. presidential election, we look at the crucial swing state of Georgia and where the race between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump stands. In Japan, campaigning is in full swing ahead of a snap election next week. More than 1,300 candidates and nine officially recognized political parties are contesting 465 seats in the Diet's lower house. 
The ruling Liberal Democratic Party is fielding 342 candidates, but it's not endorsing nine other LDP members linked to a slush fund scandal, meaning they will run as independent candidates. Well, CNA's Amitya Ishida has more. For this election, the number of constituencies have been adjusted based on national population statistics in 2020. Additional seats were allocated to Tokyo and four other densely populated prefectures, while one constituency was taken away from each of 10 prefectures with falling populations. To run in the election, a candidate must be a Japanese citizen aged 25 years and older. A deposit of 3 million yen or about 20,000 US dollars is required to run in a constituency and 6 million yen for proportional representation where seats are distributed based on the total votes cast for each political party. While candidates can run as independents, they are not eligible for proportional seating. Party-backed candidates also enjoy other benefits. Parties usually make their deposit for them, and they also get more publicity during the 12-day campaigning period. They can distribute an additional 40,000 flyers on top of the 70,000 allocated to independents, and they can post their flyers in front of shops and homes with the owner's consent, instead of being limited to official election campaign boards. Party-backed candidates can also make pre-recorded political pledges of up to nine minutes on national television, while independents will have only their profile shown. In all, candidates are vying for 465 seats with 289 constituencies and 176 proportional representation seats. Before Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba dissolved the lower house on the 9th of October, the Liberal Democratic Party held 258 seats, while the largest opposition, the Constitutional Democratic Party, had 98. All eyes will be on whether the LDP will be able to retain its majority in the Diet, and if and by how much the opposition can increase its seats. Michio Ishida, CNA, Tokyo. As the U.S. election approaches, the state of Georgia has become a critical battleground in the contest between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. The vice president is focusing on mobilizing voters outside major cities in hopes of securing this pivotal state. But in a swing state where every last vote counts, she can't afford any slip in her base. It's a delicate balancing act for the Democratic Party nominee, as Benji Heyer went to find out. We will ride this wave of energy from Gainesville, Georgia, all the way to the White House when we elect Kamala as the next president of the United States. The opening of a new coordinated campaign office in Gainesville with just weeks until polls close. This is not your typical Democrat voting district, predominantly white, overwhelmingly conservative. And yet, it's become a focal point of this presidential campaign. It's more of a blue trickle than a tsunami, but a rejuvenated ticket with Kamala Harris at the fore has created a sense of optimism amongst some in this Georgia town. The fact that this is even happening here and now is a sign of increased support in the unlikeliest of places. Our goal every time we have an event like this is to get more people at that event than we got last time around, because that shows us that we're growing. And to have the turnout we had tonight shows us that we've got momentum, we've got enthusiasm, that we have building something here. Democrats will know that actually winning in these deeply red Republican counties will be difficult. But even if they lose, this is about narrowing the margins, moving the needle just that little bit, especially in rural areas. The hope for them is those small gains can make a big difference in this election. It's why Kamala Harris has been campaigning herself in these rural regions on a big bus tour. Now, Savannah, the baton is in our hand. The picture, however, is not as bright as it seems. Kamala Harris is far from sweeping this state. In fact, experts predict the path ahead is looking rather ominous. That's because many African Americans are shifting towards the Republicans, attracted by Donald Trump and feeling let down by the Democrats on the economy, immigration, foreign policy, abortion or social issues. For a state that's a third black, that could be detrimental for Harris. She's not getting the black vote she needs. 
Uh, she's somewhere around 80% of the black vote. Sometimes as low as in the upper 70s, the low 80s. But I haven't seen a poll yet which shows her anywhere close to the upper 80s, which is what she needs to be. So she's not getting her base vote that she needs. In the back room of a Cajun restaurant in Atlanta, a gathering of black voters sharing food and feelings. Most people round this table were once Democrats, no longer. Now they see Kamala Harris as a masquerader, someone who doesn't represent their values or interests. Instead, they're breaking bread over the billionaire businessman. Sure, Donald Trump is not to everyone's taste, but life, they say, was more palatable under the former president. Yes, with his sloppy communication and his inability to kind of word things in a very diplomatic way, he commands respect. We're not in a relationship, he's not my baby daddy, he's not my pastor, he is a businessman that loves this country and is willing to fight to the death. Do I think that Kamala Harris has overlooked the black community? 100%. When I talk to folks, whether it's at the park or at a basketball court or at the barbershop, many of them are moving and looking at it as a, not who likes me, they're not thinking about racism, they're not thinking about all these other emotionally charged arguments brought forth by the left, but rather they're looking at it through the lens of performance and programs policies. Kamala Harris insists she's working to earn the African-American vote and that she understands there's no guarantee of her taking it just because she's black. She recently unveiled a plan to give black men an economic boost with fully forgivable loans as well as investment in black teachers. Local Democratic Party leaders, meanwhile, are playing down concerns, praising her for stepping across the aisle rather than just relying on her base. I believe that because Kamala Harris is such an advocate for the people, that it wouldn't matter where she's where the Democratic Party is losing votes, where she wants to make sure that she reaches out to every single American because she will be a president for every single American. That is, of course, if the vice president can beat the former president next month. And to come out on top, she'll need to target every vote possible in this tightly fought election that's still too close to call. Benji Heyer, CNA in Georgia. And that's all we've got for you on East Asia tonight, this Friday. Don't forget your headlines anytime at cna.asia. And uh, you can always look us up on Facebook, YouTube and on X. Thanks for watching.